Helen's Babies, Part 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Helen's Babies by John Haberton, Part 11. As I drove up to the steps of Mrs. Clarkson's boarding house, it seemed to me a month had elapsed since last I was there, and this apparent lapse of time was all that prevented my ascribing to miraculous agencies the wonderful and delightful change that Alice's countenance had undergone in two short days. Composure, quickness of perception, the ability to guard oneself, are indications of character which are particularly in place in the countenance of a young lady in society. But when, without losing these, the face takes on the radiance born of love and trust, the effect is indescribably charming, especially to the eyes of the man who causes the change. Longer, more out-of-the-way roads between Hillcrest and the Falls, I venture to say, were never known than I drove over that afternoon, and my happy companion, who in other days I had imagined might one day, by her decision, alertness and force, exceed the exploits of Lady Baker or Miss Tin, never once asked if I was sure we were on the right road. Only a single cloud came over her brow, and of this I soon learned the cause. "'Harry,' said she, pressing closer to my side and taking an appealing tone, "'do you love me well enough to endure something unpleasant for my sake?' My answer was not verbally expressed, but its purport seemed to be understood and accepted, for Alice continued, "'I wouldn't undo a bit of what's happened. I'm the happiest, proudest woman in the world, but we have been very hasty for people who have been mere acquaintances, and Mother is dreadfully opposed to such affairs. She is of the old style, you know.' "'It was all my fault,' said I. "'I'll apologize promptly and handsomely. The time and agony which I didn't consume in laying siege to your heart, I'll devote to the task of gaining your mother's good graces.' The look I received in reply to this remark would have richly repaid me, had my task been to conciliate as many mothers-in-law as Brigham Young possesses. But her smile faded as she said, "'You don't know what a task you have before you. Mother has a very tender heart, but it's thoroughly fenced in by proprieties. In her day and set, courtship was a very slow, stately affair, and Mother believes it the proper way now. So do I. But I admit possible exceptions— and mother doesn't. I'm afraid she won't be patient if she knows the whole truth, yet I can't bear to keep it from her. I'm her only child, you know. Don't keep it from her, said I, unless for some reason of your own. Let me tell the whole story, take all the responsibility, and accept the penalties, if there are any. Your mother is right in principle, if there is a certain delightful exception that we know of. My only fear is for you, said my darling, nestling closer to me. She comes of a family that can display most glorious indignation when there's a good excuse for it, and I can't bear to think of you being the cause of such an outbreak. I've faced the ugliest of guns in honour of one form of love, little girl, I replied, and I could do even more for the sentiment for which you're to blame. And for my own sake I'd rather endure anything than a sense of having deceived anyone, especially the mother of such a daughter." Besides, you are her dearest treasure, and she has a right to know of even the least thing that in any way concerns you. And you're a noble fellow, and— Whatever other sentiment my companion failed to put into words was impulsively and eloquently communicated by her dear eyes. But, oh, what a cowardly heart your dear cheek rested upon an instant later, fair Alice! Not for the first time in my life did I shrink and tremble at the realization of what duty imperatively required. Not for the first time did I go through a harder battle than was ever fought with sword and cannon, and a battle with greater possibilities of danger than the field ever offered. I won it, as a man must do in such fights, if he deserves to live, but I could not help feeling considerably sobered on our homeward drive. We neared the house and I had an insane fancy that instead of driving two horses I was astride of one, with spurs at my heels and a sabre at my side. Let me talk to her now, Alice, won't you? Delays are only cowardly. A slight trembling at my side, an instant of silence that seemed an hour, yet within which I could count but six footfalls, and Alice replied, 
"'Yes. If the parlour happens to be empty, I'll ask her if she won't go in and see you a moment.' Then there came a look full of tenderness, wonder, painful solicitude, and then two dear eyes filled with tears. "'We're nearly there, darling,' said I, with a reassuring embrace. "'Yes, and you shan't be the only hero,' said she, straightening herself proudly, and looking a fit model for a Zenobia. As we passed from behind a clump of evergreens which hid the house from our view, I involuntarily exclaimed, "'Gracious!' Upon the piazza stood Mrs. Mayton. At her side stood my two nephews, as dirty in face, in clothing, as I had ever seen them. I don't know, but that for a moment I freely forgave them, for their presence might grant me the respite which a sense of duty would not allow me to take. "'We's comed up to wide home with you,' exclaimed Toddy, as Mrs. Mayton greeted me, with an odd mixture of courtesy, curiosity, and humor." Alice led the way into the parlour, whispered to her mother, and commenced to make a rapid exit, when Mrs. Mayton called her back and motioned her to a chair. Alice and I exchanged sidelong glances. "'Alice says you wish to speak with me, Mr. Burton,' said she. "'I wonder whether the subject is one upon which I have this afternoon received a minute verbal account from the elder Master Lawrence.' "'If you refer to an apparently unwarrantable intrusion upon your family's circle, Mrs.' "'I do, sir,' replied the old lady. "'Between the statements made by that child, and the hitherto unaccountable change in my daughter's looks during two or three days, I think I have got at the truth of the matter. If the offender were any one else, I should be inclined to be severe, but we mothers of only daughters are apt to have a pretty distinct idea of the merits of young men, and—' The old lady dropped her head. I sprang to my feet, seized her hand, and reverently kissed it. Then Mrs. Mayton, whose only son had died fifteen years before, raised her head and adopted me in the manner peculiar to mothers, while Alice burst into tears and kissed us both. A few moments later, as three happy people were occupying conventional attitudes, and trying to compose faces which should bear the inspection of whoever might happen into the parlour, Mrs. Mayton observed, "'My children, between us this matter is understood, "'but I must caution you against acting in such a way "'as to make the engagement public at once.' "'Trust me for that,' hastily exclaimed Alice. "'And me,' said I. "'I have no doubt of the intentions and discretion of either of you,' "'resumed Mrs. Mayton, "'but you cannot possibly be too cautious.' "'Here a loud laugh from the shrubbery under the windows "'drowned Mrs. Mayton's voice for a moment, "'but she continued, "'Servants, children,' here she smiled, and I dropped my head, "'persons you may chance to meet.' Again the laugh broke forth under the window. "'What can those girls be laughing at?' exclaimed Alice, moving toward the window, followed by her mother and me. Seated in a semicircle on the grass were most of the ladies boarding at Mrs. Clarkson's, and in front of them stood Toddy, in that high state of excitement to which sympathetic applause always raises him. "'Say it again,' said one of the ladies. Toddy put on an expression of profound wisdom, made violent gestures with both hands, and repeated the following with frequent gesticulations. "'As radiant as the matchless woes that poor artist fancy, as fair as whitest lily blows, as modest as a pansy,' "'as pure as dews that hides within a wawa's sun-tissed chalice, "'as tender as your primrose wheat, all jish and more is alish.' "'I gasped for breath. "'Who taught you all that, Toddy?' asked one of the ladies. "'Nobody didn't taught me. I learned it.' "'Footnote. Learned. "'When did you learn it? "'When it just mornin'. "'Ock and Howie said it over and over and over.' "'Just yachts of times out in the garden.' "'The ladies all exchanged glances. "'My lady readers will understand just how, "'and I assure gentlemen that I did not find their glances at all hard to read. "'Alice looked at me inquiringly, "'and she now tells me that I blushed sheepishly and guiltily. "'Poor Mrs. Mayton staggered to a chair and exclaimed, "'Too late! Too late!' Considering their recent achievements, Toddy and Budge were a very modest couple as I drove them home that evening. 
Budge even made some attempt at apologizing for their appearance, saying that they couldn't find Maggie and couldn't wait any longer, but I assured him that no apology was necessary. I was in such excellent spirits that my feeling became contagious, and we sang songs, told stories, and played ridiculous games most of the evening, paying but little attention to the dinner that was set for us. "'Uncle Harry,' said Budge, suddenly, "'do you know we haven't ever sung "'Drown Old Pharaoh's Army Hallelujah since you've been here? "'Let's do it now.' "'All right, old fellow.' "'I knew the song, such as there was of it, "'and its chorus, as every one does "'who ever heard the Jubilee singers render it, "'but I scarcely understood the meaning "'of the preparations which Budge made. "'He drew a large rocking-chair into the middle of the room "'and exclaimed, "'There, Uncle Harry, you sit down. "'Come along, Todd. "'You sit on that knee, and I'll sit on this. "'Lift up both hands, Todd, like I do. "'Now we're all ready, Uncle Harry.' "'I sang the first line. "'When Israel was in bondage, they cried unto the Lord. "'Without any assistance, but the boys came in powerfully on the refrain, "'beating time simultaneously with their four fists upon my chest. "'I cannot think it strange that I suddenly ceased singing, "'but the boys viewed my action from a different standpoint.' "'What makes you stop, Uncle Harry?' asked Budge. "'Because you hurt me badly, my boy. You mustn't do that again.' "'Why, I guess you ain't very strong. That's the way we do to Papa, and it don't hurt him.' "'Poor Tom. No wonder he grows flat-chested.' "'Guess you's a Kai baby suggested Toddy. This imputation I bore with meekness, but ventured to remark that it was bedtime. After allowing a few moments for the usual expressions of dissent, I staggered upstairs with Toddy in my arms and Budge on my back, both boys roaring in refrain of the negro hymn, "'I'm rolling through an unfriendly world.' The offer of a stick of candy to whichever boy was first undressed caused some lively disrobing, after which each boy received the prize. Budge bit a large piece, wedged it between his cheek and his teeth, closed his eyes, folded his hands on his breast, and prayed. "'Dear Lord, bless Papa and Mamma and Toddy and me, and that turtle Uncle Harry found, and bless that lovely lady Uncle Harry goes riding with, and make him take me, too, and bless that nice old lady with white hair that cried and said I was a smart boy. Amen.' Toddy sighed as he drew his stick of candy from his lips, then he shut his eyes and remarked, "'Dee Lord, bless Toddy, and make him good boy, and bless them ladies that told me to say it at den.' the particular it referred to being well understood by at least three adults of my acquaintances. The course of Budge's interview with Mrs. Mayton was afterward related by that lady as follows. She was sitting in her own room, which was on the parlour floor, and in the rear of the house, and was leisurely reading, fated to be free, when she accidentally dropped her glasses. Stooping to pick them up, she became aware that she was not alone— a small, very dirty, but good-featured boy stood before her, his hands behind his back, and an inquiring look in his eyes. "'Run away, little boy,' said she. "'Don't you know it isn't polite to enter rooms without knocking?' "'I'm looking for my uncle,' said Budge, in most melodious accents. "'And the other ladies said you would know when he would come back.' "'I'm afraid they were making fun of you or me,' said the old lady, a little severely. "'I don't know anything about little boys' uncles. "'Now run away, and don't disturb me any more.' "'Well,' continued Budge, "'they said your little girl went with him, "'and you'd know when she would come back.' "'I haven't any little girl,' said the old lady, "'her indignation at a supposed joke "'threatening to overcome her dignity. "'Now go away.' "'She isn't a very little girl,' said Budge, "'honestly anxious to conciliate.' "'That is, she's bigger than I am. "'But they said you was her mother, "'and so she's your little girl, isn't she? "'I think she's lovely, too.' "'Do you mean Miss Mayton?' asked the lady, "'thinking she had a possible clue "'to the cause of Budge's anxiety. "'Oh, yes, that's her name. "'I couldn't think of it,' eagerly replied Budge. "'And ain't she awful nice? "'I know she is.' "'Your judgment is quite correct, considering your age,' said Mrs. Mayton, "'exhibiting more interest in Budge than she had heretofore done. "'But what makes you think she is nice? "'You are rather younger than her male admirers usually are.' "'Why, my Uncle Harry told me so,' replied Budge, "'and he knows everything.' "'Mrs. Mayton grew vigilant at once and dropped her book. "'Who 
is your Uncle Harry, little boy? He's Uncle Harry. Don't you know him? He can make nicer whistles than my papa can, and he found a turtle. Who is your papa? interrupted the lady. Why, he's papa. I thought everybody knew who he was. What is your name? asked Mrs. Mayton. John Burton Lawrence, promptly answered Budge. Mrs. Mayton wrinkled her brows for a moment, and finally asked, Is Mr. Burton the uncle you are looking for? I don't know any Mr. Burton, said Budge, a little dazed. Uncle is Mamma's brother, and he's been livin' at our house ever since Mamma and Papa went off visitin', and he goes ridin' in our carriage, and— Humph! remarked the lady, with so much emphasis that Budge ceased talking. A moment later she said, I didn't mean to interrupt you, little boy. Go on. And he rides with just the loveliest lady that ever was. He thinks so, and I know she is, and he specs her. What? exclaimed the old lady. Specs her, I say. That's what he says. I say specs means just what I call love, cause if it don't, what makes him give her hugs and kisses? Mrs. Mayton caught her breath and did not reply for a moment. At last she said, How do you know he gives her hugs and kisses? Cause I saw him the day Toddy hurt his finger in the grass cutter, and he was so happy that he bought me a goat carriage next morning. I'll show it to you if you come down to our stable. And I'll show you the goat, too. And he bought. Just here Budge stopped, for Mrs. Mayton put her handkerchief to her eyes. Two or three moments later she felt a light touch on her knee, and wiping her eyes saw Budge looking sympathetically into her face. I'm awful sorry you feel bad, said he. Are you afraid to have your little girl ridin' so long? Yes, exclaimed Mrs. Mayton with great decision. Well, you needn't be, said Budge, for Uncle Harry's awful careful and smart. He ought to be ashamed of himself, exclaimed the lady. I guess he is then, said Budge, cause he is everything he ought to be. He's awful careful. T'other day, when the goat ran away and Toddy and me got in the carriage with them, he held on to her tight so she couldn't fall out. Mrs. Mayton brought her foot down with a violent stamp. I know you'd spect him, if you knew how nice he was, continued Budge. He sings awful funny songs, and tells splendid stories. Nonsense! exclaimed the angry mother. They ain't no nonsense at all, said Budge. I don't think it's nice for to say that, when his stories are always about Joseph, and Abraham, and Moses, and when Jesus was a little boy, and the Hebrew children, and lots of people that the Lord loved, and he's awful affectionate, too. Yes, I suppose so, said Mrs. Mayton. When we says our prayers, we prays for the nice lady what he specs, and he likes us to do it, continued Budge. How do you know? demanded Mrs. Mayton. Cause he always kisses us when we do it, and that's what my papa does when he likes what we pray. Mrs. Mayton's mind became absorbed in earnest thought, but Budge had not said all that was in his heart. And when Toddy or me tumbles down and hurts ourselves, tain't no matter what Uncle Harry's doin', he runs right out and picks us up and comforts us. He froed away a cigar the other day. He was in such a hurry when a wasp stung me, and Toddy picked the cigar up and ate it, and it made him awful sick. The last named incident did not affect Mrs. Mayton deeply, perhaps on the score of inapplicability to the question before her. Budge went on. And wasn't he good to me today, just cause I was forlorn, cause I hadn't nobody to play with, and wanted to die and go to heaven, he stopped shaving so as to comfort me. Mrs. Mayton had been thinking rapidly and seriously, and her heart had relented somewhat toward the principal offender. Suppose, said she, that I don't let my little girl go riding with him any more. Then, said Budge, I know he'll be awful, awful unhappy, and I'll be awful sorry for him, cause nice folks oughtn't to be made unhappy. Suppose, then, that I do let her go, said Mrs. Mayton. Then I'll give you a whole stomach full of kisses for being so good to my uncle, said Budge. And, assuming that the latter course would be the one adopted by Mrs. Mayton, Budge climbed into her lap and began at once to make payment. Bless your dear little heart! exclaimed Mrs. Mayton. You're of the same blood, and it is good, if it is rather hasty. 
End of Part 11. Read by Kara Schallenberg. On March 15, 2008, in San Diego, California.